Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight to our first speaker sessions of 2024. Um, this will be our third year of speaker sessions, and we've had such wonderful um, guests in the past, and we're very excited about our guest, Holly G, tonight. I am Renee Rogers. I am the head curator at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum in Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia, and my colleague Sam Parker is running tech. We are excited tonight to be hosting Holly G, and she will be talking to us about the Black Opry. So before we get into tonight's conversation, let me introduce you to Holly G. Holly G is a country music industry disruptor. In April 2021, she founded the Black Opry, which began as a website and Twitter account celebrating the Black performers working in country, Americana, folk, and other adjacent musical styles. And this quickly grew into a vital voice. That's a quote from Billboard magazine within those genres, devoted to advocating for Black entertainers and helping the marginalized group reclaim its place in the American musical canon. The Black Opry Review, the organization's national touring showcase, began in October 2022, and Holly G launched Black Opry Records in partnership with 30 Tigers in September 2023. Holly's writing has appeared on Grammy.com, in Holler, Taste of Country, and The Boot, as well as in the Quarterly Roots Music Journal, No Depression. Sam will put a link in the chat to the Black Opry website for any who any people who would like to check it out. You can also see some great videos there, both of media appearances, but of musical performances. And you can take a look at their tour schedule and see where you might be able to catch them yourself. And so with that, I just want to say a big welcome from the birthplace of country music to Holly G. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. Hi, everybody. Very excited to join you guys. We are snowed in here in Nashville, so this is a perfect little <laughs> fireside chat <laughs> yes we are snowed in here too and i think it's a good night for everyone to be cozy and learn some new things about country music so yeah. i gave um the audience a, a brief introduction but just first tell us a little bit about your connection to country music what drew you to it and what makes the the music so special to you i get asked this a lot and i wish there was like a better more like poetic answer but the truth <laughs> is that I just heard like um I think the first country music song that I remember hearing was Achy Breaking Heart and I just heard that and it was over <laughs> <laughs> um I, I love all types of music but country music is uh the style of music that I'm most drawn to and enjoy the most um all of my like I, I'm very I attach music to memories a lot and all of the music that I choose to like remember things it's always country music and it's just what I like <laughs> did you have other family members who liked country music too no which is really weird my mom did, did have very eclectic taste so I mean she would play everything from like Luther Vandross to the Carpenters um so I got exposure to a lot of different types of music but I don't remember her listening to I think the only song I can remember her listening to is maybe like Breathe by Faith Hill but other than that, she was very like top 40 type of thing. So I, I have no idea where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> it just must be in your soul. That must be it. Yeah. So what inspired you? Like, what was the, the moment that you knew that you wanted to create something like the Black Opry? Um, so it was during the quarantine for COVID when we were all just kind of like sitting at home trying to figure out how we relate to the world. I think the combination of like the civil unrest that was going on in the country as well as the pandemic made everybody reevaluate everything. And so the biggest thing that I have consumed throughout my entire life has been country music. That's been the one constant. Um, and so I started looking at the, the people that were making the music that I loved and realized that there weren't people that looked like me. There weren't people that were uh, very vocal about you know aligning with the, the things that I believed in um, and so I was hoping to find either people that like made made music or even just listen to country music that felt more like myself um, and so the website when I created that was really just kind of like outreach to find other people um, that might even just like the music and there were way more people than I thought as a Black woman 
Um, even as a kid, if you say you like country music, you kind of get a double take. <laughs> so, you know, since I was little, I've been told like, it's weird that I like it. And, you know, I'm, I'm the only one that likes it. But I think what the truth of it was just that there were so many of us that didn't know the other were out there because there just is not that type of representation within the mainstream genre. Yeah, and I, I on your website, there's a great interview that you did with Kelly Clarkson about seeing another woman who had had a similar experience of not realizing how many other fans there might be out there. Yeah, that was wild. Like um, right around the time when I started like thinking about all these things, um, Kelly Clarkson actually had a, a woman named Rachel on her show who was um, harassed at some country co concerts and, you know, just feeling out of place. And she recounted a lot of her experiences that she had had that were negative at concerts, which ironically, like those were the same reasons why I, at that point I had never been to a country concert because I was afraid of those things happening. Um, and so that was one of the things that, you know, kind of was on my mind as I was creating Black Opry. And um, not very long after that, Kelly Clarkson's team reached out to have us on the show. And I was like, full circle. <laughs> so it was really great. Yeah, that's amazing. And it was a great episode. I really enjoyed watching that. <laughs> yeah, I, I ended up quitting my job after that, which is a really good thing, because I don't know if it's on the, the interview with, that is up on the website, but in the full interview, I was totally admitting to like not doing my job. I was like, yeah, I'll go in the bathroom and hide and answer emails for Black Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so... I set myself up a little bit, but it worked out. <laughs> well, you know, when a passion project is like that, it it takes over. You have to do that. That's yeah. the you can't you can't let it go, can you? <laughs> I just don't suggest admitting to it on national television until after he <laughs> resigned. <laughs> yeah, probably a good idea. That's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about how you started this idea through a, a website, a blog during the pandemic. When you first started it, what kind of impact um did you did the website have and how has it developed from that initial thing that you created to to what it is now? How does how is it refo how is is it focused differently or what else is it doing? Yeah, so when I started it, we were all still kind of trapped inside. And the first um like event that was coming up as the world was starting to reopen, everybody was headed to Americana Fest. And so we decided to go there to meet everybody in person that we had been talking to online and we rented this Airbnb. Um, one of the needs within the artist community that we identified very early on is um, even sometimes when Black artists are asked to come and play at these events like Americana Fest, they don't have the same network and friendships. So um, when you go to a conference like that, that's what propels your career forward is when you make those connections and get to be in the rooms with those people. And so what was happening was the Black artists were getting invited, but because they didn't have those same networks, they were getting left out of a lot of the um, conversations that people were having where they were getting really great things happening afterwards. So we rented this Airbnb to provide a space for that. And we invited just literally everybody. We were like, we're going to be here. We're going to be playing music. Um, everybody is welcome. Um, but we are going to have Black artists playing. And I thought maybe four people would come and we had probably 30 to 40 people in that house every night for almost an entire week. Oh, um, wow. Just playing music for it for hours, they would just go and go and go. Um, and so we did that. And then a week after that, um, an artist named Lizzie No had a show up in New York that she was gonna do and um, her co-bill artist dropped out and she said, can we do what we did at the house on stage? And so we called up like five of the artists that were at the house that, that week. And we went up to New York and did the show. And once we announced that we were doing that, even though it was just kind of like, an accident almost. Um, we had venues all over the country that reached out and asked if, if we would bring it there. And so um, that was around October of 2021. And since then, we have played over 100 venues, festivals, cruises throughout the country, and we've put over 100 Black artists on stages to share country mm -hmm. music. That's wonderful. And you all were recently, this past year, you were at the Newport Folk Festival, is that right? Yeah, I, we've gotten so lucky. Newport was actually the very first festival we actually played. So I was not familiar with it at the time because again, I wasn't really consuming music live in that way. And they were, they just started emailing me and 
we got a booking agent really early and I was like, yeah, this Newport Folk Fest thing, they, they keep emailing me. <laughs> Can you talk to these people? And she's like, what? I know, They're, it's such a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm so glad that we got to do that. I'm so glad that was our first one because it, it set the bar so high for the way that artists should be treated, the way that artists should be paid fairly. Um, the headliner, the, year, the first year that we played was Mary Morris and we got treated the exact same way she did as did every other artist on that lineup. And it was really, really great to see um, artists at so many different levels being respected so highly. Um, so, and we got fortunate enough to play it again last year. And we, every time we go there, we have a blast. It's just so much fun. Yeah, that when I saw that, I was like, that's very cool. From when you started just so recently to, to be on the Newport Folk Festival, that's amazing. And what an amazing place to, to perform. Yeah. I, this is uh, one of the things I wrote about in No Depression. I think it's still up on their website. But the reason, or no, that was, uh, if you go to Polestar and search Black Opry, the whole story will come up. But um, the reason we were able to do that so quickly was because Allison Russell, who had just um, created a stage for them the year before, and she brought out Shaka Khan as a surprise guest, she reached out to the festival and said, hey, these guys deserve a chance. Can you give them one? And they did. And that's why one of the things we really really advocate for is like if people ask how can they help sometimes it's as simple as mentioning somebody's name in a room because you don't yeah. know what opportunity that could get them or um, just that validation and advocation for another person goes so far sometimes and I think that that was such a huge part of us launching off as successfully as we did. Yeah we had Allison Russell at the Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion Festival this past year and she was amazing. She's magical. Yeah it was so good. Um, in other interviews, you know, and this is going to sort of go into a little bit of what the, our museum is about. You mentioned the 1920s um, segregation of sound. So that segregation between hip, what was considered hillbilly music and what was considered race music based on the color of people's skin. Um, and we explore that concept also in our museum. Um, do you what ways is the Black Opry contributing to people's understanding of that really complex music history and its impact on country music today? And especially, I mean, I'm thinking of someone like when you mentioned Achy Breaky Heart as the first song, I think of Little Nas X and, and Old Town <laughs> yeah. Road and how the Billboard charts didn't want to call that country. Um, yeah. So. Um, I think a lot, a lot of it is just like taking it right back to where it started. And, you know, our format for most of our shows is writer's round. So it's an artist. Most of the time, those artists are also really great songwriters with a guitar. And any genre of music, when you strip it down like that, it's very, very difficult to place a difference. There's so much of production and marketing materials and all of those things that get to your brain before you even know it to tell you what to describe something as. And I think for people to be able to just hear, because a lot of times we do have artists on our, on our shows that, um, you know, would maybe once their music is more heavily produced, might sound more R&B or, you know, different genre. But when you strip it down like that, you can hear that it's all just music. And I think um, just that concept, too, is very, very in line with our mission. Um, I know that race is difficult to talk about and it might be off-putting when people see oh black opera they're like oh no no, no I don't want to be I don't want to be yelled at I don't want to be made to feel bad um and that's not what we're about we are about creating opportunity and playing music um none of I think there are very few artists who set out in their careers that want to be activists or want to have to advocate for themselves most of them just want to play music Mm -hmm. um, but because of the divides that things like that genre line and created, they are forced to create a space before they can even get to the point where they're, you know, advocating for their music. Um, and that's honestly what I think it all goes back to, because if you look at, I mean, you guys know the story, but it was literally just the color of their skin. It wasn't instrumentation. It wasn't styling. It wasn't anything but the fact that they did not want black and white people on the same chart. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just try to get a little bit ahead of that. Yeah. And just like you said, I mean, the good point of how marketing can change your perception of something so much and the production and all of that, that it, it and so much of the, the whole development of genre itself is around that marketing idea of who do we think will listen to this music and therefore who do we, how do we have to classify it? And of course, most people aren't listening to music along those lines. They're listening to what they like and it can be so many different things. 
Yeah, we I did an um, interview with some of the artists that we work with, uh, like, right as we were started starting and as we began to explore like the ideas of genre like I, I ask as many artists as I can like how do you feel about it how do you prefer to be labeled like what are your thoughts on it and one of the threads that I hear very often is like artists feel like it's better to not classify a, an artist as a single genre sometimes like a genre from any artist should be able to make a country song or a rock song or a hip hop song or whatever they want to make without their entire career being focused in that one box. Yeah. And I I remember um, at the International Country Music Conference, we got to see a performance by the Black Opry, which was amazing. But each of those artists had their own, you know, some of them sounded very, very country, like Aaron Vance, I remember, sounded very, very country. And um, I think it was Denisha and I can't remember, I can't remember what the third artist was now. Um, uh, Julie Williams, I think. Yes. Yeah. And they were all very different, but they all had that storytelling quality that I really think of for country music too. The stories that were being told in those songs were just fit in completely with my idea of country music. And, but each of them had their own style and it was really beautiful. Yeah. And I think if you like really go back and listen, like somebody who I think about a lot um, is like Lenny Williams. Um, who made really great what we consider R&B music, but his music was so much like storytelling. And I think if we just didn't have in our brains, like the way that we think that genres should look ingrained in us, like some of these uh, Black artists that have been making R&B music would have been country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's so much of that country blues crossover, especially in the Mm -hmm. 1920s and 30s. Um, So... We recently, with another connection to the museum, we've just closed an exhibit on women in old time music. That was our our most our big special exhibit in 2023, and it it highlighted 2015's Salad Gate incident, which I'm sure you know about. Some of our some of our listeners and viewers might not know, so I'll just explain what Salad Gate is very quickly. In 2015, there was an interview with a radio consultant. I believe his name was Keith Hill, talking about what's was successful on country music radio. And he said that women weren't the meat of the salad, they were the tomatoes. Like all the other bits of the salad were the male country artists and the women were the tomatoes that you sprinkled a little bit into the salad, but they wouldn't sell records. They they wouldn't like push the country station further. And so you only had them every once in a while because they just didn't sell the way male artists did. And it turned into this huge thing, I think, a lot of female country artists um, were wearing tomato t-shirts and <laughs> and it became known as hashtag salad gate. Um, but that dismissal of women on country music radio was the essential part of it. Um, what does country music radio look like for the representation of black audiences and, and live performances? Cause that is that you all have that sort of, you're probably seeing that as an organization having to deal with that sort of dismissal of being of having your the same equal space there yeah it's really interesting so country music is the last genre of music that is so focused on terrestrial radio you really have to be a successful radio artist a charting artist to be successful in any other facet of the industry it's the only genre that is still like that um and dr data watson has done a really great job collecting statistics on what country radio looks like over the past 20 years, I think it's either 0.4% or 0.04% of Black artists that have been played over a span of 20 years. Um, and so, and we have not seen any change or increase in that. I think the last, she concluded that, and I, I want to say 2021, and then they just did another report recently, and there was no change or increase in that. And I think a lot of times when we are advocating for artists in this space, it's really easy for people to be like, oh, well, I know Darius Rucker and I know Kane Brown. There's no way you guys are having issues. But the fact that you could name two off the top of your head, (laughs) um, that tells you right there, like, especially for Black women who are getting that, that double marginalization, there's, there's nothing there for them. And, um, if this were a different genre of music where you could go around it with streaming, Mm -hmm. I think it would be an easier pill to swallow, but it's really frustrating and difficult that the 
central gatekeepers that could really help make a difference and make an impact have refused to, I wouldn't even say refuse to budge. They, they don't even have the conversations. Yeah. Um, it, I can at least say that all of the, I mean, CMA, CMT, ACMs, all of them have sat down with us and at least attempted to hear us out as far as figuring out the problem and making things better and different different people have had different levels of success with the things that they've um, been able to implement. But um, I think the goal is to at least have everybody trying in good faith. And the fact that we cannot even get radio to listen. I think that there are more people at within country radio that think and believe in the same way that Keith Hill did than there are people that want to see it change because at the end of the day, those are business people and what they're doing is making them a lot of money. And so yeah. um, they're, they don't see anything wrong with it. They're like, hey, this is working. It's successful. Why would we do anything different? Um, and so when you are arguing morality versus dollar signs, it's almost like you're speaking two different languages. So it's really, really yeah. difficult. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't, that's one thing, despite the fact that we actually have a radio station in our museum. So you'd think I would know this, but I didn't even think about how um, dependent country music is still on the radio, like you said, the terrestrial radio side of things. Um, yeah, that, I mean, it makes a huge the difference. Charts, the, your, the charts dictate, like, if you get awards nominations, um, whether sponsors will pick you up, um, your touring opportunities, all of that is dictated by the charts, which are based on radio. So yeah. like no way to get around it. And it's so tricky. I mean, and this is something that, you know, that women have faced. It's something that people of color face that all sorts of different underrepresented groups face is that if you also don't have um, representation in those decision-making spaces, it's very difficult. Yeah, everything, I, <laughs> my least favorite thing to hear is, well, it's the board's decision. <laughs> <laughs> there are all of these mysterious faceless boards in <laughs> Nashville that decide everything and nobody has any autonomy apparently but anytime I go and look up who's on the boards it is very very largely straight white men mm -hmm. um and I feel like that should be a concern for everybody because I one of the things I love about country music is how different the song the songs and stories are there's that common thread of that feel of country music and you know it when you hear it um but there's so many like if you look at like I listen to everything from like Tyler Childers to Luke Bryan so I love all of it and we're miss we're leaving so much on the table by not including people that don't look like us yeah I think you know as a person of color and a woman like I have been forced to listen to country music that doesn't represent who I am and I've, I've been able to fall in love with that it that way. And so I don't think that it's as big as a, of a hurdle as people think it is for them to be able to like and enjoy people, people's music that comes from different backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. So do you, how do you think the artists that you work with today are impacting the genre itself and the fans' perception of it? Do you think that that's, even if it's small steps, that those steps are happening by seeing the Black Opry performers and learning about their songs and their stories is making that is making a difference? I think it's making a difference, but not in the way that people assume. Okay. So I think that the mainstream country music industry and even honestly, the mainstream Americana industry, I know that they um, advertise themselves as more inclusive, but it's really the two sides of the same coin. I don't think that those two industries as they exist will change. But what I do see happening is we are building something completely separate from those um, with the same music, good music, but just it's, we're having to build our own audience for it and build things like Black Opry mm -hmm. um, to accommodate the appetite for something that's a little bit different. It would be great if everybody woke up tomorrow and was like, look, we're going to fix everything. <laughs> but, you know, these problems took so many decades to develop into what they are. I think that we would be waiting for just as long for them to be fixed. And so I feel like the most effective solution to that is to build our own institutions outside of those industries. Mm -hmm. And we can absolutely, like, uh, participate and engage when they have the um, 
appetite and capacity to do so. We love going to the award shows and um, when like for the past few years, we've had artists that have worked with us that have got, got named CMT Next Women of Country. And so we are certainly supportive of the mainstream, but we're also very cognizant that we have to build our own institutions outside of that so that we can exist without being dependent on them. Right. And, and what impact do you think you've seen on the artists themselves just by having this community and by having this opportunity to work together and to, to learn it, to sort of get those networks and get those contacts? Um, I think that it's been, it's, it's kind of like a double-sided thing. So much of it has just been not even like anything to do with like careers or anything like that, but so much of it has just been healing. Right. Um, if you ever find yourself in one of our green rooms, I guarantee you somebody's crying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we just, all of us have gone so long and feeling like we were so alone in this. And so when we all get together, like it inevitably inevitably happens. Somebody will start it, and then everybody's crying. Just and it, it's always tears of joy. We're just really happy to have found each other and have this community. And so, even if nothing else were to happen, that would have been enough. Um, but on top of that, we've seen these really, really great strides that some of these artists have made. Um, like Roberta Lee, for instance. She, I remember, I met her as I was starting Black Opry. We met on Twitter. And she was like, I really, really want to go to Nashville and I want to make country music, but I'm scared they won't accept me. Um, and she went from that in 2021 or in 2020 to being named 2022 CMT Next Woman of Country. Um, she self, she crowdfunded to put out an album, which she like got great players, great producers on. Um, it's been named one of the top albums of last year by a few different publications. Um, we've seen, there's another artist that we work with who, when I met him, he was actually living right by you guys in East Tennessee, um, over, I want to say like right by Johnson city. Oh, okay. And he was living in a trailer out there working at a call center and he's now a full-time touring musician. Um, What's his name? Jet Holden. Yeah. You guys actually had him on, uh, Bristol Rhythm and Roots. Oh, okay. That, yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I think I do recognize that name. Yeah. And so to be able to see like people's day to day lives being changed that quickly yeah. um, has been really, really great. And that to me is a testament to the fact that the reason that they're being left out is not because of their talent. They're so talented. Right. Um, it's just a lack of access. Yeah, those are those are great stories. And I love that there's someone from this area that's been impacted. That's wonderful. Um and definitely going from a call center to a full full time touring musician <laughs> sounds like a great change. <laughs> yeah, he's having a blast. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, one of the other things that I've seen when you've done interviews or when you've talked to journalists is you've also talked about just some of the other work that is that has gone on before you and is still going on to help change country music's um, internal perception of what country music can be. Um, can you tell us just a few, about a few of those those people or organizations that are helping to to do this work? Yeah, so one of the first um, people, things that I found was Reese Palmer and I harassed her on the internet until she agreed to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, she runs Color Me Country, which is an Apple music radio show in which she features artists of all different backgrounds and perspectives, um, just kind of bringing people together over the diversity that exists within country music. She's also a really great um, owner host for CMT. so. She is, she's a black woman, so she's a really great source of not only like advocation, but representation within the space. Um, she has a Color Me Country Artist Grant Fund. If you guys want to look that up, feel free to go donate. She gives artists micro grants, which allow them to, that's, so the artist I just told you about, Jet, the reason he was able to record his first singles because he got a grant from her. And the great thing about the way that she does grants is that there is no application pro process. The word grant can feel overwhelming but it's literally just, do you play music and do you need some money? And if you say yes to those two things, she just gives you the money in good faith. And she has helped so many artists through that grant fund. So please, please, please donate to that if you can. And There's, Sam, if you don't mind to look that up, you can put it in the chat for everyone. It, yeah, Color Me Country Artists Grant Fund. There's that, there is um, the Equal Access Program, which is based here in Nashville, which is run under M Theory, which is a management consulting company. M3, M Theory selects not only three artists, but three artist managers of color, which is really, really important. 
um, as you were saying earlier, to have perspective from people of color behind the scenes. So they take three artists, three managers, and they give them $25,000 as well as um, mentorship and training throughout the year. That program has been really awesome. We collaborate with them as much as we can. There's also um, an organization here in Nashville called Shoes Off Nashville, which supports AAPI artists that make country music. We partnered with them over the summer and recorded a song with Will Hogue, and that was probably one of the best days of my life, honestly. We had 40 people in the Sound Emporium studio, which is like a really historic studio. Uh, Charlie Pride, all these cool people have recorded there. And they, we all came together and recorded a country song. And it was, I'd never seen so many people that look so different come together for the sake of country music. It was really, really beautiful. And it was so positive. So check out Shoes Off Nashville. And for, um, for those of our listeners who might not know what AAPI stands for, it's Asian American Pacific Islander. Yes. Um, um, and so... That's great. I mean, I would. And why is it called Shoes Off Nashville? That's that was my next question. I have no idea. <laughs> That's an interesting name. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling it's a cultural thing that probably has something to do with that's the huge thing in their culture where you take your shoes off when you enter oh, somebody's yeah. home. Okay, it makes sense now that you've said that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, there's those ones. There's. Um, the Academy of Country Music, the ACMs, they have on-ramp program where artists of color can apply to that to be in a leadership and development program. I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's so many different ways to help. Um, and we're really, really excited to see that there's so many other people um, kind of pulling the rope with us. And do you see um, support coming from some of the artists themselves in, in who have been established in country music? Do you see that at all? Yeah, every now and then. The thing is, I really have to talk to people in person. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important for people to be able to, um, or not even just me, but like for them to come to something and let the walls down and kind of see. Um, so it's not such a, because it it's really scary and difficult thing to talk about. And once they kind of see that, like, our focus is the music, we just want to be able to play the music same as you. A lot of times those walk, walls come down. There have been some really great people who have been supportive of us from the very beginning, though. Um, like, one of the first things we got to do when we came to Nashville was Cam um, invited us to her studio. Mm -hmm. And even that still, like, makes no sense to me. <laughs> um, I'm like, why would she invite us there? That's brilliant and amazing. And, you know, every now and then, sometimes I'll just run into people. Um, we were at an event at the, um, where were we? Somewhere in downtown Nashville, Country Music Hall of Fame. And Jaron Johnson from Cadillac 3 was like walking down the street. And I got to sit, sit and talk to him for a bit. And I think it's so encouraging when we do get to talk to some of these more established artists and we do get that support from them um, because at this point, I don't think the pressure is going to come from behind the scenes. I think that not even just with this issue, but for a lot of the issues that we see in the music industry, as far as like streaming payment and um, like AI protections, a lot of what we will see change from going forward are going to be artist led initiatives. Um, and I think that's kind of true, not only for this industry, but if you look at all the different strikes that are happening across the country, like we need the people that are doing the work to kind of lead the, the change and lead the charge for that. So I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more of artist engagement in that way. So we'll see. Um, so before we, we jump on to the last couple of questions, a couple of things you said made me want to ask a few extras. One is when you were talking about that first um, Americana, Airbnb, all everyone coming together and playing music. I know that you're out here advocating for for musicians. You're out here helping them to get on stage. But are you a musician yourself? Oh my God, no. <laughs> Everybody asks me that too. Since I work at a music museum, and I'm like, uh, no. I wish. Nobody would have ever heard of me if I was doing this off the back of me being a musician. <laughs> I would have never got this far. But you know what I am though is like the biggest music fan, and so as hard as this is, and it is hard and it is like 
um we have a lot of fun but there's a lot of dark days i get a lot of trolling and hate mail and all of those things and it gets really tough but every like every now and then you just get a moment like we played luck reunion and they were like come get on stage with willie nelson and i'm like i can't sing there's nothing i can do up there like they don't need me and they were like you are never going to get the chance to walk on stage with willie nelson again go up there and stand far away from the microphone and so we did and like every now and then I get to do something like that. And it just, it's the coolest thing in the world. And so all of the the good things kind of balance out and take the weight off from that heaviness. It, Cause I'm living like every music fan's dream. There are so many times when I have like um, random people that I'm such huge fans of just like sitting in my living room playing a song. Like it gets no better than that. So mm, yeah. And yeah, going on stage with Willie Nelson, I'm jealous. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I came off stage and I was like, well, I'm done, guys. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> we accomplished the goal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I've had that feeling with um, when I got to talk to someone from my favorite podcast and it was like, I was like, okay, I'm, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me and I'm okay now. Yeah, like you made it. <laughs> um, and my next question is, you know, at the very beginning, when we first started talking, Holly, you said that when you saw the woman who was on the Kelly Clarkson show originally, Rachel, um, that you hadn't yourself been to a country music concert since no, the at first, that point. The, the first like country music concert event type thing I ever went to was um, the CMA invited me to CMA Awards when I first started this. That was my intro to everything. I had bought tickets to see a lot of things a lot of times, but I would always back out at the last minute because I couldn't get any, none of my friends like country music and they're so glad I have somebody else to talk to. So I'll leave them alone. Um, <laughs> but I could not for the life of me find anybody to drag with me to these concerts. So I hadn't been to one. And then, um, early 2020 I got to a point where I was like I'm so tired of missing out on something that I love like it's not fair to me to have to miss this because somebody else is making me afraid um to participate and so I bought tickets to CMA Fest and I bought tickets to see Ashley McBride and then two months later COVID hit and oh, so no. <laughs> <laughs> everything shut down that's that's irony uh, right there <laughs> yeah but I did end up um and at CMA Fest the next year with much much better seats than what I got refunded for. <laughs> and I got to see that. Ashley McBride uh this past September at Pilgrimage Fest which is amazing it was such a long time coming but it was so much fun so is there someone that's on your bucket list that you'd really love to see there's so many people I really need to see Brett Eldridge I don't know what he's doing I feel like he's hiding under a rock right now but I need to see Brett Eldridge I'm obsessed with Charlie Crockett and I still have not seen like I've seen him at a couple different like award shows and things but I've still not seen a full show from him and it's driving me insane um I feel like I have to see like a Garth Brooks set somewhere like I want to do that too yeah <laughs> I mean the, I have such a long list but honestly there was something about um Ashley McBride that felt really really safe to me um she seemed to be attracting fans that were more open-minded and um that just felt like a, a little bit of a safer environment and I don't know if that's just because she leads with kindness herself or what it is but um she was honestly just at the top of my list so um getting to see her oh and I was obsessed with Miranda Lambert as well so that was really 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 I had bought tickets to see Miranda Lambert five times and every single time um I chickened out oh. it, but as she, she was played the CMA awards last year and she did like this medley and it was like it felt like a set list that I curated it was all my favorite songs of hers so I was like we got it this is good <laughs> nice and what about a bucket list of somewhere you'd like to see the Black Opry perform somewhere or someone somewhere somewhere um which venue this is so random but there is a, a venue in texas called the lonesome rose that i'm obsessed with it mostly just because charlie crockett mentions it in a song there's no not really a better reason <laughs> 
Um, I really want to play there. We'd love to come to Bristol Rhythm and Roots. I love what you guys are doing I would love out to there. see y'all here. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, there's not really like a dream. What I would love to see is like for us to play a festival that was a festival with a mainstream country artist where there was some equality built in the lineup. I don't care where that is or what that looks like, but to see not just more black artists, but more female artists and more artists of other um, backgrounds, other BIPOC artists, queer artists, like just to see a country music festival that looks a lot more like what the world does. Yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. So before we turn it over to questions from the audience, Tell us a little bit about where people can experience the Black Opry in 2024. Yeah, so we have launched um, the first, I want to say 20 or so dates for the year, and we've got eight more that we will probably launch in about two weeks here. But if you go to blackopry.com or blackoperyreview.com, one of those is in the chat already, um, you can see the tour. I would try to tell you where we're at, but I really don't remember. <laughs> We're kind of all over the place. But I will say if anybody who is in this chat, if you go and you see um, a city near you that you would like to go to, if you um, send an email to blackopry at gmail.com, we will put you on our guest list and you can come for free. Oh, that's so generous. Thank you. I'm going to yeah, go look at this right after. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been so interesting, Holly, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, you know, when I saw, like I said, when I saw the Black Opry this summer, it it really was an amazing show. I loved all the artists. I follow all of them on Instagram now um, and like to hear about what they're up to. And I remember, especially, I think one of the songs, and I believe it was Julie who sang it about her mom and the, the CD, yeah. the music CD she played, which I really loved. Um, so I would wholly recommend to the group here um, to check out the Black Opry, try and see them in person because it was a great show and it was it was wonderful to see all the different stories that were being told by the, the Black artists on stage. So thank you so much for being with us and um, we'll turn it over to Sam and he can tell us about some of the questions that have come into the chat. It doesn't look like we've had any questions so far? So I'll, I'll give everybody a little bit more time to type out any questions they've had during the presentation. Uh, Alma Douglas did say that she, that, uh, she loves attending Rhythm and Roots and wants to learn more about the Black Opry events and such. And do you have any other just off the top of your head places to learn about Black Opry or any of the artists associated with Black Opry that you'd like to uh, relate? Um. I'm going to pull up our tour schedule because I don't want to have to try to remember things. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are over on the west coast at a venue called Freight and Salvage in Berkeley, California, about six times a year. Um, we've got Bar Vermont coming up. I think if you guys, if any of you guys are located over by where the museum is, the closest thing would probably be we're playing Wolf Trap, which is kind of near Washington, D.C. That show is going to be a really fun show. Um, there are so many artists that we have now that have been with us since from the very beginning, and those artists um, are really fun to watch together because they know each other so well now. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like watching siblings on stage and they know all of each other's songs, and so they kind of sing backgrounds. Um, the way that our shows are formatted, we have two different formats. If it is a show at a venue, then it's going to be a writer's round, which will have three to five artists that are on stage at the same time. Um, and the cool part about it is they, you get to hear the stories about the songs in real time um, and you get to hear them interact. And um, one of the things that we love that always happens is somebody will play a song and the person next to them will be like, oh, I was going to play a different song, but I have one that's kind of like a response to your song. And so you get to see them kind of dig through their catalogs together and find music that um, relates to each other and they get to tell their stories back and forth that way. Um, if we do a festival set, that's typically where we pull the band out, which is also really fun. That's what we did for Newport. And we also, we do play bigger festivals like we're playing Tortuga Fest uh, on April 6th, which is down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, when we do those bigger festivals, we also will sometimes bring in other artists from the bill 
which is always, it's always so much fun to get to do that. We, the first time we played Newport, we were able to get uh, Joy Lodkin to come and play with us. Um, so it's always fun. And stuff. You never really know what you're going to get. And two, if you go to two different shows, they they'll be completely different because every lineup is different. Um, so if we come back to your city more than once, then you see. I'm glad you mentioned Wolf Trap, Holly, because um, Alma is our Smithsonian liaison, and so she's up in D.C., so that'll be close to her. She can go check it out. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Alma, send me an email at blackopry at gmail.com, and we will get you taken care of and make sure you get, get in to see us. That's so exciting. And uh... David Winship asked, is there some place within Black Opry for an educational program about old Black artists like Brownie McGee, Howard Armstrong, Carl Martin, or even introduce new audiences to Charlie Pride? Um, we would love to do something like that. There are so many things that we want to do, honestly, but it's all this happens so quickly and so on accident, like just for context, I started in 2020 when I was working full-time as a flight attendant and since then I have had to quit that job because um, so I quit to Nashville and now I'm living here and working in the music industry full-time and that was so much it's it's just so much bigger than I had assumed it was going to be in such a short period of time so there are a lot of pieces to it that we're hoping to figure out ways to build out and the educational piece is definitely one of them um, we try to do as many like panels and things like that where we host the panel so we can cover some of those topics um, as often as we can, but it's definitely something that we want to uh, focus more on in the future. I will say too, like one of the really cool things about the community that we have is like, we have so much history that is still here with us. Like uh, Frankie Staten, she started the Black Country Music Association back in the 1990s, which was an organization very similar to what we're doing now. Um, and I say all the time, the only difference is that we have social media and she did not. Otherwise, that would have been, um, I think we probably wouldn't have needed to do this if she had better resources and tools back at that time. But Frankie is has been trying to play country music for 40 years and um, now she's still here playing it with us. So it's really cool that those things get to overlap. There's actually it is online but there's an exhibit right now in the country music hall of fame part of their american currents exhibit um that shows the bridge between the work that frankie and clee francis were doing back in the 90s all the way up to the work that we're doing doing today so i feel like we still have so much history here with us um we try to make sure that we are being um intersectional and always in our shows and that includes being intergenerational so we have at a lot of our shows, we will make sure that we have representation from older artists who have been doing this for a long time um, to come into the world. So, yeah, well, I will tell you, Frankie, one thing she says all the time, and she was like, I don't think anybody's going to believe anything I said, so I videotaped everything. So <laughs> she has, I mean, she, you know, she was in the same rooms as like Merle Haggard and Charlie Pride and like all of these country music legends. And she has footage of like the shows that she was doing back then. Um, I feel like there's so much history just like right under our nose. There's another question here from Teresa Burris, um, well, a comment and a question. She says, thank you for an inspiring discussion. Holly G, I appreciate your bravery. Are you familiar with the Afrolachian writers? Frank X. Walker coined the term in 1990. Nikki Finney reads one of her poems, Black Country, on the documentary Coal Black Voices that I think would resonate with you. Also, have you explored international venues for the Black Opry? I know audiences abroad would value the music. Um, I'm not familiar with the Appalachian writer that you mentioned, but that sounds really interesting. I'm definitely going to look that up. Um... And then what was the other part of the question? So she said that Nikki Finney, who is one of those Afrolachian writers, mm -hmm. reads one of her poems, Black Country, on the documentary Coal Black Voices. I'm going to just write in that down. Look that up. Thank you for that. 
Um, and we actually, we interviewed um, Frank X Walker on our Radio Bristol Book Club last year because we did his book Afrolatcha, which is his book of poetry. So I'll um, I'll send you the link to that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, that so much of this stuff. I feel like there's still so much I have to learn because I was not intending to do any of this. <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly, <laughs> um, I had I didn't really foresee my role being more than just a fan of it and so um there's still a lot of learning and catching up that I have to do I feel like I was just fortunate enough to be for some reason put into these spaces and so I do the best I can to um communicate what I do know but also connect people with um other people who know a lot more than I do because <laughs> I, I think too it's so different to remember that like my perspective and my opinions are but one of many from the Black community. And so I also try not to overextend myself as a voice for anybody. And like, my role is to get you to listen to more people than just myself. Well, and one of our other um, participants sort of echoes what Teresa was saying about international audiences, um, asking again about plans on expanding the Black Opry in some form to other countries. The UK has quite a growing country music scene. Reese's Color Me Country Takeover at the Long Road Festival in Leicester has been a huge hit the last couple of years. Yes, that is something we are really excited to try to do. But also um, one of the things that we do as far as touring is to try to lower the barrier of entry so that marginalized artists can have a better chance and a better opportunity. And what that means is we, um, we pay as well as we possibly can um, we really, really advocate for rates that allow us to compensate the art artists as fairly as possible. And we also, within that, anytime we send somebody on tour, we pay for them to have somewhere to stay. What we never want to do is send an artist to a show and then come back, um, even, which even that is a struggle sometimes. And so um, we are definitely interested in doing things internationally, but the price point it's and it's not anything towards us or anything like that but the cost of touring right now is not adding up to what they're offering um and so if I can't make it make sense financially I will not ask artists to do it just because I don't think that it's fair to I mean they can they can always go and do that on their own and I will facilitate those conversations if they want to but we don't put together anything that's going to leave them any worse than we found them Uh, let's see. We have a couple more questions. What has, and Erica says, what has been your favorite part of the journey since starting the Black Opry? Um, my favorite part, honestly, is that literally anybody is listening to what I have to say about country music. Um, and I don't mean like listening as far as me having influence. I mean, listening as far as like um, just even getting to have conversations with other people about like, what what's your favorite thing right now or that kind of thing. Um, it was very, very isolating for this to be my favorite thing and to feel like I did not have other people that um, not, it's not even a thing of like having people that have things in, in common with you or like that look like you, but sometimes um given the stereotypes that surround people that like country music can it can be a little bit scary to open up that door to have conversations with other people that like country music because a lot of times those people don't necessarily want to have conversations with people that look like me and so that can be a little bit frightening and so now to have this entire community of people from all different backgrounds that I can call and be like oh my god did you hear the new Tyler Childers record like that's been the most amazing thing to me is just to be able to find the community and also um, working in the music industry means you get free ticket concerts to like everything. And that's <laughs> that's a lifelong perk. Honestly, it's better than my flight benefits that I had as a flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> and probably a um, nicer work environment too, because I know it can be stressful up in the air. <laughs> it depends on the day. <laughs> Um, let's see. Tina McDaniel says, thank you, Holly. What is one thing you would want us to know about the Black Opry that we should know and you would want shared with others? 
And second question, what gives you hope as you pursue this work? Um, <clears throat> one thing I think I want everybody to know is that we are just like everybody else. Um, we're not doing anything scary. We're not um, out to make anybody feel bad. And we're not aiming to push anybody away. We just want to be included. Um, and the heavy conversations are not as hard as you think they are. And I think that a lot of times, whatever the core of those heavy conversation is, everybody leaves better for it. So um, don't be afraid to engage, even if, and don't, don't be afraid of like, oh, I don't want to say or do the wrong thing. Nobody is expecting anybody to be perfect. What we're asking is for people to be open. Um, and so I would say that was, that would be what I want people to know. Um, what was the second part again? I'm sorry. Um, what gives you hope as you pursue this work? Um, I think every time that, um, like, I don't go to all the shows anymore because there's too much traveling. Um, but when I do go to shows, like when I get really overwhelmed or discouraged, I try to get out to one of our shows. And I've never been to a show and not had somebody come up to me and be like, I did not think I liked country music, but I had no idea that it could be done like that. And we've had people come to shows and say things like that and then follow up later and be like, oh my God, I loved your show so much that I went and looked more into country music. And um, now I fell in love with Luke Combs too. Um, and not to say that straight white men need any more exposure. I think they're doing great right <laughs> now. But I think that is a testament to the fact that like, what is good for the most marginalized person is good for everybody. If we can bring more people to this music um, that feel welcome and feel safe, that will be a step in the right direction for literally everybody across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, it's opening the doors for people to see what's there. And like you said, representation, it matters so much to feel like you have a place and you can be comfortable and you can enjoy that as much as anyone else. So I think that's, yeah. a, that's a wonderful thing for someone to say. Um, when Kelly says, thank you so much for this. You know how much we appreciate your work and dedication. Sorry, I got to this a bit late. Asking the hosts if this interview will be available on replay. So yes, we do record each and every one of our speaker sessions. And usually they get up on our website, um, usually about a week or so later, depending on how we're a very small staff, how, how long it takes us to get it edited <laughs> and, and up there. But um, I will send the link with the survey so you know where to look for it. So just keep an eye and it will be there in a week or two. Hi, Gwen. Thanks so much for joining us. It's always good to see you. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alma Douglas, um, our Smithsonian li liaison, has said something else. She says she, she loves your commitment to have those artists recognized as part of the country music genre and would also love to connect you with our folk life and cultural heritage program at the Smithsonian. So I will be sure and s connect you all by email tomorrow. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I don't know if this is the same part of the Smithsonian or I, I really don't know how all that works, but um, Jake Blunt, who did something with Smithsonian Folkways, I want to say, um, is an artist that works with us a lot. And when I say like the people that know more than me, like he's one of those people. He has a bunch of degrees and stuff I can't pronounce. And if you ever go to one of his shows, he can he like recites historical monologues in between his songs. He's there's just so much knowledge in his head, and he. Um, what he does is he reinterprets old time music. And so he, he doesn't write music, but he takes these old songs from like the 1800s and reinterprets them. And um, sometimes he does them in a straightforward old time way, but then sometimes he does them in like a futuristic way. And it's just really cool. He's one of the, the Black Opry people we love, so. And he also works with the Black Banjo Reclamation Project, I believe. Yeah. yeah he's another great organization. Yeah, we had um, Hannah Mary, who I think is in charge of that. She actually just played a show with us for the first time a couple months ago. So, Oh, amazing. Yeah, that was really exciting. She shared a really great image um, from the work that they're doing with us for the Women in Old Time exhibit. So, yeah. Awesome. All, all these little connections, it's nice to yeah. see. Um, okay, I think that's all the different 
questions and comments. Um, that's awesome. We got a lot of interaction and a lot of interest. So hopefully you'll see some of us at your show soon. Yeah, that would be great. Like I said, anybody who's here, happy to get you guys out to um, a show. And thank you all for just showing up and being open-minded and helping us move forward. Sometimes just listening is a good way to help. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, and another big thank you to Holly. We really appreciate having you and hopefully um, we'll be able to keep connecting in different ways. Um, before we go, I just wanted to remind everyone that you'll be getting a survey in the next couple of days and please do answer that if you have time. It's always helpful to us. And I also just wanted to share a few of the other upcoming events at the Birthplace of Country Music over the next month. Um, if you want to know anything about what we're doing, you can go to the birthplaceofcountrymusic.org to our events tab and it will have all the information there. Our next speaker sessions is on Tuesday, February 13th at 7 p.m. And we'll have Bailey George and Jessica Stiles on country music duets um, in honor of Valentine's, Galentine's, anti-Valentine's Day, however you feel about it. Um, they'll be in person at the museum and you can also watch virtually via YouTube. Um, we also have just opened our new special exhibit, A Cardboard History of Blue Ridge Music, and it will be on display here in the museum through July 21st. On Thursday, January 18th, at 12 p.m., tune in to Museum Talk on Radio Bristol, both on the dial locally, but you can also stream via our website or mobile app. And we'll be talking to curator Damian Thomas at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture about its collections, especially items related to the civil rights era in this week of Martin Luther King Day. On Saturday, January 20th, we have our rescheduled Bluegrass Jam from 2 to 5 p.m. And then on Saturday, January 27th, from 1 to 4 p.m., we are hosting the Tennessee Songwriters Week qualifying round. That is now closed to entrance, but you can still purchase to be a spectator in the audience. On Friday, February 2nd at 10.30 a.m., we have Museum Storytime when we'll be reading Dolly Parton's Coat of Many Colors and have a sing-along with Mama Molasses and a fun craft activity for toddlers and tots and their grown-ups. And then on Saturday and Sunday, February 10th to the 11th, from 1 to 4 p.m. on both days, we are hosting a cardboard dulcimer workshop with musician Roxanne McDaniel when you will get a chance to go home with a cardboard dulcimer you have built yourself. Um, so those are just a few of the things coming up, um, and I hope that we'll see some of you there. But in the meantime, thanks for being with us tonight, and thanks again, Holly. Bye, everyone.